Welcome to the Just Women Sports Podcast, where we talk to the biggest athletes in the world about the untold stories behind their success. I'm Kelly O'Hara, and my guest today is Sam Uess. Sam Uess is considered by many to be the best soccer player in the world today. At UCLA, she led the Bruins to their first ever national championship. In the pros, she's won three NWSL championships and shields. In 2019, she helped the U.S. Women's National Team win the World Cup in France. And in 2021, ESPN named her the best player in the world. Today, Sam plays for Manchester City, Samchester City, in my opinion, and is preparing to represent her country in Tokyo. Alongside Lynn Williams, she also hosts Snacks, a new podcast from Just Women Sports. Sammy, welcome to the show. Hi, Miss Kelly. Thanks for having me. The Tower of Power, Samuel Mewis, is here with us all today. How are you? Hi. I'm good. Thanks, Kelly. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, it's Monday and I'm already tired and the week has already started off to a grand start, but you know what? That's I know. Sometimes. Yeah, I know. I, did you have a game this weekend? I did not, so I shouldn't be that tired, but you know, <laughs> that's that's, yeah, that's how it goes. You know, Kel- my nickname for Kelly is old bag of dirt. Oh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> what is it? Old bag of dirt. You know what? You're not wrong. You're not wrong. I'm not wrong, but I'm, I'm getting up there too. So you are, you are starting, um, to get up there. Um, and I'm pretty excited about this little convo we're about to have because of how closely I've been able to see your success just skyrocket and close to you and see how you've handled it and your and I know what's happening behind the scene <laughs> and the wheels that have been turning but before in we, the panic yeah the, the yeah. Panic, panic is a is a theme um <laughs> in in your in your story I would say but you you're definitely like um you're definitely the duck analogy where you you seem most people probably don't know that you're panicked all the time but because you just present as like gliding a to- a- along the water on top of the water and then your feet underneath are going like crazy um but yeah before we get to <laughs> you being a duck let's go back to when you were a duckling <laughs> you were a small little baby duckling maybe not a tower of power yet um back to sammy in boston as a as a wee little thing what was what was boston uh, growing up for Sam, what was it? Yeah. Like? What was growing well, up? Well, well, I grew up with my sister, Christy, obviously, obviously. We grew up in a, in a little town about 20 miles South of Boston called Hanson. Um, and yeah, I mean, my like earliest memories obviously are really just like playing soccer in the backyard with Christy. We used to see who could juggle the most and like her patch of grass was all worn down. It was down the bottom of the yard by the swing set. And my patch of grass was all worn down up the top by like the hose and like the cellar door. Okay. So you guys um, kept it separated. You like had kept your it, own space. kept it separated, had her own space. But like, I remember she'd be like, I got 65. And then I'd be like, damn it. I can only get 12. So I have to like keep working. And I think my, again, like my earliest memories are just like trying to be as good as her. We play one V one in the backyard. We'd like watch the U S women's national team on TV. So definitely very like soccer centric from a young age. And I think having Christy, uh, like helped that and kind of made us both competitive right away and, and wanting to succeed like really ever since we like learned what the national team was. Um, but when we played you, a bunch of, when do you think you, you learned what the national team was? I'm curious. I think like right around the 99 world cup when I was like seven. Okay. So you're, you're super young. Okay. Yeah. Um, but like we played a bunch of other sports. My mom played basketball in college, um, like division one. So she always really wanted us to play basketball. And obviously I am pretty tall. Um, so I loved playing basketball. I loved swimming. Um, we both ran track one year in high school. We, we just like loved doing anything sports and anything outside. And my mom would have to like beg us to come home at night and come in and eat dinner. So we were just always like outside doing something. Love it. I feel like that's, that, that was definitely same with me growing up. When did you start soccer? Like what, what age did your parents actually take you to your first soccer practice? I think like five, I think there was like a kindergarten league that was probably just really just snack time outside for everybody. But I remember like the little yellow pug goals and it was just right down the street at the elementary school. Do you remember what your first soccer team's name was? No. Or do you remember any good ones? growing up 
I, I guess my teams weren't like really like names. Like we were always just Hanson youth soccer. Oh, interesting. Okay. Cause yeah. And then, and not until my club team, which was Scorpions, which is, I love that name. I still keep in touch with my Scorpy sisters. Wow. Scorpions as a club name. I don't feel like most clubs, like once you get to club, I feel like then it's, it's whatever the town name is or like an act, a proper football club, but Scorpions. Not us. No. You Scorpions, guys baby. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we sure were. We were pretty good though. That's amazing. I had, um, I played with my brother on one team and we were called the blue power Rangers, And that's, that's <laughs> the team that I remember the name. I was pretty into it. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, so you, you played a bunch of different sports growing up. Did you ever think about like, was soccer always it for you or, or was, yeah. Was there something else besides no, basketball? No, I mean, I did love basketball, um, but like soccer was always it. And I think it was mostly because my sister and because of the national team, like I knew who those women were right away. I like had posters of Mia Hamm and Michelle Akers on my wall. And I felt like that was the biggest like representation that I saw. So that was like what I gravitated towards because I felt like I could do it. And I think so did Christy. And so we kind of like played off each other in that way. Like we both knew that that was the plan and like yeah. the goal. Um, so I think once we like really were exposed to that, we like really stuck with it. At what point did you realize, oh, I could, or soccer's it, like I'm quitting everything else. I'm doing soccer. Yeah. And well, also, sorry, before you answer that, did you and yeah. Christy play on the same club team? Um, she played for Scorpions too, but she was older. So she played okay. an age or two above. And then we did play on the same high school team for two seasons. Did you guys, um, win? no, the year that like we, so my sophomore year, her senior year when like, and we were going to really be pretty good. We both had a, a U 17 or a U 20 world cup. So like, um, we kind of weren't there and we missed a lot of the season, dang. um, which was a huge bummer. But then the next year the team with just me, like Christy left. And then me and all my like high school teammates, like we went on and we did pretty well. Um, we had some like great players on our high school team. There was a couple girls who, um, also like went on to play in college and were really pretty good. So it was a fun group. I, I loved my high school team. Nice. Hanson high school, Whitman Hanson high school. It was like two towns. Okay. Okay. Cause Very cause cool. Hanson was pretty small. So we like merged with Whitman. All right. What, yeah. what was your mascot there? The Panthers. <laughs> Really? Yeah. I was Panthers too in high school. No I didn't way. know this. Oh what God. were you guys' colors? Black and blue. Oh, ours were black and red. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. That's so fun. I, I know. Oh my gosh. I, know. I, I love, love my high school. Sorry, I keep asking about names and mascots, but that was Oh, fun. it's okay. That, that was fun. Oh my God. Go Panthers. Go <laughs> Panthers. Um, Still say it to this day. Stars Mill High School. Go Panthers. So <laughs> Christy... Christy's basically like you're, did, did you feel like you were kind of as a kid, you were, you were kind of just following in her footsteps. Like Christy did something you're like, I want to do that. Oh yeah. And I think, um, in like, in some ways it must've been so annoying for her, but I, and I, I always say this, that like, for me, her, like she paved the way. So I remember like, I was probably in sixth grade and Christy was 14 and she started getting called into like the night, remember like Nike ID and Yep. whatever like the 50 camps were and then yes. the U, her first ever like U15 national team camp in California where like a hundred kids go yes and so like she started doing that and I would realize like oh my god Christy's like getting recognized on a national level and like starting to understand like this is beyond just making the state team and beyond making like the region one team at at ID camp and all this stuff um she started like getting recognized by the national team and when I got my like first invite into camp, I like remember exactly where I was. I was at this girl's house and I, my mom like texted me or something that I like got an email or something getting invited to camp. And I had always known like that Christy was doing it. So it wasn't as far away as it might have felt to other people. Sure. Um, if you like never know anybody who gets called in, you're like, oh my God, never in a million years would they ever pick me. But Christy was that like close representation to me where I like realized it was possible. Totally. Um, so she definitely like paved the way in that sense. And yeah, like I, I like rode her coattails as far as I could. Like she, um, did everything before me and kind of like showed me how to do it. 
That's amazing. Question. Cause you and Christy are how many years apart Two. How many months? It's, it's like 18, 19 months. Okay. Yeah. So my sister and I, 60 months apart. Did you guys get along really well growing up or? Oh God, no. <laughs> oh God, no. It was a nightmare. We were, I mean, you know us now and like, yeah, our like personalities are different, but like complimentary. I think like we get along so great now for sure. Um, because I think that we like have our core values the same and, but that our personalities are just a little bit like they're unique. Ca- yeah. And like counter yeah. to each other. Yeah. But are. growing up, like it was, it was terrible. Like we would just fight, we would fight in the car. We would fight. Like my mom would get so upset at us. Uh, my mom would be like sad. Like I should say, like, I want you guys to be friends. Like, I don't understand like what we're doing wrong. Like, why don't you like each other? Um, and I think it was just, we were just different. And like, I must've been so annoying to have like buzzing around all the time, like trying to be friends with Christy's friends and trying to like play on all her teeth, like all this stuff. So I'm so grateful. We get along now we're best friends, but yeah, it was like kind of a nightmare growing up. We were not very close. That's hilarious. And, and <laughs> also to be expected, mom, you did, you did nothing wrong. You were doing everything right. It's just siblings. That's just, the I, know. Way I know. So you remember exactly where you were when you got your first youth team call up. What, what team was it? it was like you 16. No, I think it must've been like, it was that first like U 15 camp. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you got in right at the, the ground level. Well, yeah, I, I like matured pretty early. Like got pretty tall, pretty fast, surprisingly. Um, so I think like my physical advantage helped me out at that age. (laughs) So for, for the people, everyone who's listening, the way soccer football, um, worked in terms of like working your way up through the ranks in the youth level to potentially one day aspire to be on the women's national team, you the and I don't know if it's the same way anymore. So maybe somebody who listens to this episode could write just women's sports an email and say if it's different now. But you would go, you would have state ODP, you'd make your state ODP team, you'd go to region camp, you would all the teams, state teams would compete against each other, and then they'd pick a pool from those group of players to represent the region. And then from the region team, that as at that young age, the region team, all four of them would go to this. 50 to 75, maybe 50 player camp. That was like a youth camp and it was the best players in the country. And you were one of them. Yeah. I mean, I got, I got invited and I got to go. And, and how did that, how, how did it feel? Like what was your first reaction or experience at that level? Cause it's very different. You know, as a kid, you're growing up, you're playing against your peers in your town, you know, you remember traveling state to state, maybe, um, you know, throughout the country, but then you, you're up against the best players every single day. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I, I don't remember much, but I do remember the camp I'm envisioning was in California at like Cal Poly. Okay. Um, and Massachusetts is like, or whenever I was growing up was like kind of a hotbed of like soccer talent. So there was a group of us from Massachusetts who maybe like played on rival club teams, but were kind of there together. Um, or at least from region one, like I, I think maybe like Crystal was there. Okay. Like Crystal and I came up together the whole time. Shout out Crystal. So, so what I'm remembering anyway, was just kind of being grouped in these teams that we already knew a little bit, some of the people and, and I just wanted to do so well right away and get recognized right away. And I have always put a lot of pressure on myself. I'm kind of like a perfectionist and would just overanalyze and like make a mistake and be like, okay, I made a mistake. I'm never going to get invited back. Started kind of having to learn like some mental training skills, like very early on. Um, So I don't remember all that much, but I do remember like one time having to go up to a coach and just being like, what do you think I could have done better in this situation? And she was kind of like, um, like taken aback that I was like already asking that because it was like kind of in the middle of a game or something like, yeah, it was crazy, (laughs) but that a 15 year old would want like constructive criticism in the moment. Yeah. Like, it, I don't know. I was kind of like a little bit of a weirdo. So I don't, I'm, I might also be like blending camps together. I'm not really sure. Yeah. So when you went into that, cause the way the system works is that you get called in, but then it's kind of a tryout every single time. I mean, not kind of, it is. And 
you either get called into the next one or you don't. So did you, once you got into that first camp, were you consistently called in and in that system? Yeah, I was. I, I think then it kind of got into that smaller group with the U 15s, um, where we would like go to, and we would go and train at the home Depot center. Um, and we like started to maybe have games like occasionally. Um, but those youth teams like were very structured. Like you were learning the philosophy of the coach. You were kind of like seeing if you had everything that it took to play for a national team, not just on the field, but off the field as well. Even just like I was 15 years old and traveling to California without my parents. And I don't know, I didn't know anything. My parents just kind of had to be like, okay, like go ahead. Um, so yeah, I, I started getting called in at that age and then I got, kept getting called in consistently and, and eventually made that U17 World Cup team with my sister um, in 2008. Yes. Yeah, so you two made history in 2008 as the first sisters to ever play together on a U.S. World Cup team with that U17 women's national team. So what was it like to do that together at that level? Yeah. I mean, I think like at the time, everybody was like, oh my God, that's so special. And we were kind of like, yeah, I guess it like will be special someday. Like, we don't know, but like still shoot, like, I mean, we're in high school now, so we still weren't friends. Like we mm. still very much so were competing. I mean, or just kind of like you annoy me, get away. <laughs> exactly. I think it was much more that. Um, so it was like so fun and cool. It was in New Zealand. Like it was oh, surreal, wow. but at, at the, like at the same time, like I was 15, like, or 16, like, I don't really know. I know that we lost in the final, which was like such a bummer. It was a really fun tournament and like, so cool to be a part of that. I think it was also the first U17 world cup. Um, so cool to travel like that part of the world, but if only I could like do it now, like, I just don't really remember as much as I should. And I don't think like fully appreciated every experience as much as I could have. Makes sense. I mean, I was, a, I was a child. Yeah, you were, you were an <laughs> adolescent at that yeah. point. And you were, I mean, you made the U17 team. What, how old were you? You're younger, right? You were like, I was, one of the I, youngest players on the team. I, yeah, I think there was maybe a couple people younger, but it was for the 91s and I was a 92. So I made okay. it like, I guess a year early. Nice. Well, so you, you're, you know, being recognized on this national level, obviously one of the best players in the country at this point as a teenager coming up through high school, which means you have the ability to basically handpick what college you want to go to in the reality, you know, in reality, as an, a, a person or a player who's in the youth national team system, that's just the, the opportunity that you kind of get at that point, because that's just, that's how I saw it go down when I went through it. So for you, when you were, you know, starting to think about college, you're from Boston, you end up still have an accent, by the way, which I love. <laughs> and when you're Thank around, God. <laughs> when you're around Pat, it gets even stronger, uh, but, I know. but you end up at UCLA. So what was the process of picking a college like for you? Yeah. Well, I think that I wanted to go to like a top school and I wanted to win and I wanted to like grow as much as I could as a player. So, um, in the area, it seemed like Boston college was the best school for that, but Christy was already there. So I like, kind of right away, I had my dad tell the coach there, like, don't, don't, look at me. <laughs> don't yeah, be contact her <laughs> because I just think we all knew that like, I shouldn't keep following Christy. Um, and I think my whole family was probably relieved by that because I think everybody needed a little bit of like, okay, they need to like, Sam needs to like forge her own path a little bit. Hmm. Um, and I feel like that's exactly what I did. I, I looked at like a bunch of schools, but none of them were close. I think the closest one was Virginia, okay. which I loved. And I love Steve Swanson and would have been a great place to go. Um, but I looked at a ton of schools. And I think just when I visited UCLA, I remember saying so many times, like the, in the locker room, the girls seemed like they like really wanted me there and they were really nice. And I had just this great feeling about like the locker room and, and how the team felt to me. Um, so I picked UCLA and like, I remember my mom at first was like, so like kind of horrified, like, no, like that's the furthest one. Like, I'll never get to see you. Like, wasn't really ready. But as soon as she came on a visit with my dad and I, she was like, oh, okay. Like, I totally understand you come here. I'll come visit. It's going to be great. Cause the campus is just beautiful. And I think my parents realized I was like in really good hands and they were going to take really good care of me. So picked UCLA and made some incredible lifelong friends who I love. And we won the national championship my junior year. I know 
That's amazing. I didn't, I didn't think UCLA has ever won, but I guess I forgot that you guys won. Sorry. I guess you forgot. I did. I clearly did forget. 2013. Um, 2013. So what was your favorite part? Doesn't have to be a soccer part of going to UCLA, attending UCLA. <laughs> um, Why are you giggling? I'm just giggling. Cause college was just like good, time. Whew, good, time. good times. Um, I think about it all the time because I, I just didn't realize like that I, I had soccer and soccer was like a huge priority and a huge responsibility. But like outside of that, I was just like free as a bird. Like life was so great. I was living in California. I could do whatever. I'd go to the beach, go to class, go grab a sandwich. Like it was just so fun and like social. And like, I had no like life responsibilities. So I, I do miss that kind of like freedom and like carefreeness. Um, so that was probably the best part to be honest, but I made like the best friends. I, I think my like college relationships, we had Sarah Killian's wedding. Um, I don't know, a couple Novembers ago. And like, it was the same, like we, it's just a group of goofballs. It's like Abby dog Kemper, Megan Oyster and Rosie white and Allie Courtney, Capri, Sarah, the whole group. Like I probably just forgot somebody and they're going to be so annoyed, but she loves you. Don't worry. I do. <laughs> She's on it's the just like, it's just like a fun group. And, yeah. um, I just love them. And it was because I was so far away from home. I think having like those kinds of friends was really important for sure. I agree. So had, had the, um, panic, Sammy panic, uh, personality trait set in yet. Did you have that? In oh, that's that set in when I was like nine. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's like, like, we, probably I, I even younger, that. but I can only attribute it to like memories and when I was like nine, I was making lists of like my schedule for the day. So Sam, I'm pretty sure you will make a to do or a, a an, an itemized thing on your list of like, do the list. Like that well, would be something that you would I, put down. Yeah, it a hundred percent is one so that you can cross it off and you get that like immediate yeah. feeling of like, sometimes you just put stuff on the list that you've already done because then it helps you get, feel like you're really rolling. But I have like to-do lists and like schedules and there's probably five like working notes on my, in my phone that are just constant updates. Like this is my to-do list for this area of my life. And this is my great. schedule. And this is my to-do list for this area of my life. And it just makes me feel a little bit more in control. Yeah, I, com I completely agree. I actually admire your level of organization and ability to be a task ma master. You are yeah. able to do and that. You're yeah. very good at it. Thank you. It, I mean, it helps me because Lord knows we all need it. We all need it. Well, okay. Not to get too far into your, um, we'll, we'll pull back and go back to soccer, but <laughs> you, you get PAC 12, all freshman team honors. Do you remember that? You don't remember that. Well, what was the biggest, do you, do you remember the biggest change or um jump you had to make from playing as a call or as a high school player as a club player as a youth national team player to college like do you remember do you feel like you had that a moment or just realized oh this is a lot different um I think that soccer wise I mean of course there was like a transition I think it was like everything was just the next level. It was like more demanding physically and more demanding tactically. So I think of course there was a jump. I'm like, not saying that there wasn't, but, um, my experience with the youth national teams and, and just the fact that I had done that several times before, I think really helped with that. I would say like the bigger transition for me was off the field. And I think realizing that I was responsible for like my own actions and decisions and that I didn't have like my parents weren't around to help and, and, kind of having to be responsible for like how I handled myself and, and treated my body off the field. And I think that that was a transition for me. Just it's a good college was such a good, like I'm not at home anymore, but I'm not like a hundred percent responsible for everything. It was kind of this like halfway house of like real life, yep. um, which I definitely needed. I think I grew up a lot and learned a lot and just kind of realized that like, I needed to be like a responsible adult for my own life. Great lessons to learn. Yeah. Oh, uh, what'd you major in? I majored in English, which you're very good at. Well, thank you. I think I proofread uh, friends 
papers and like emails and like stuff for people still. Um, so like, I do kind of think that I can like write an email without any grammatical mistakes, which is a good, I think a good quality to have, but I did really like it. I like, I love reading. Um, I like actually really enjoyed most of my classes that I took. I took this one like old English class that was like the English, like wasn't even letters that you could recognize. Like it was actually another language and I just took it because it like fit in my schedule nicely. Like I think I had, like, and it, like, it like went towards your major. Point yeah. Point and I, I think I only had class like one or two days a week. So I was like, oh, sick. Like I'll just take this. And it was such a nightmare. Was it the hardest class you took in college? An old English class? It was, it was up. I mean, it was up there. I definitely like struggled in several other classes. And like, I thought I was going to fail music because I failed the midterm and had to learn a song on guitar to play in front of the class for extra credit so that I wouldn't like actually fail the class. What was the midterm? I don't know. It was just like, I like, I have no idea what happened. I like studied and everything. And then I think the questions were just not what I was anticipating at all. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't expect any like album releases from you anytime soon. No, no, not my area. Okay. Fair enough. Well, your area is again soccer, one of them, also task mastering, yeah. task mastering. But I forgot, but this did happen. You won your junior year. This is yeah. UCLA's first women's national or like national championship, yeah. right? Soccer championship. For, for women's soccer, yeah. Crazy. I know. It was crazy. I mean, it was one of the reasons why like I went there. I think the group of us that went, like a bunch of those girls that I named before were all in my class. And we all wanted to like go somewhere and be a part of winning the first one. I think just because obviously UNC is such a good option for top players. It's so many people go there, but they've won so many times that in the back of some of our heads, we were like, let's go somewhere and like win it for the first time. Um, So we, we had like a really tough run into it too. We had to beat UNC in the elite eight. And then we played Virginia, which was so hard. And I think what that went into PKs. And then we played Florida state in the final and went into double overtime. So it was, it was wild. It was like just one of those like miracle runs. It all came together and it all came together. It was great. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. I sadly don't have a national championship um, from my time at Stanford, which is again, very sad. And I, and I remember UCLA for so long, like they could, they would make the yeah. final four. They would, they would be in the final and there's just no championship to their name and you guys won the first one so did so you said a group of you guys wanted to go to UCLA and win and you know kind of forge your own path outside of the the soccer dynasty which was UNC which was kind of the way I felt towards going to Stanford was did you guys talk about that before like as you were being recruited I think well as much as like we knew to I think that maybe the the people recruiting us and the, maybe the girls on the team, even like that was kind of like a point to bring up was like, come here and win the first one. Um, and like your class is going to be so talented. And then kind of, we all started being like, Oh, like, are you going to go? Like, are we going to do that? Are we? So I think it kind of started, but I didn't know everybody super well. Um, I think cause Abby's like a 93, so we didn't play together all that much before. Um, but But I mean, same in the same class. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Well, you, you go from winning UCLA's first national championship and then you get called in to the national team. Is this correct? So you win in December and then did you get called into camp that next, what, February? Oh, I, I guess I'm not sure if it was my, was it your senior or junior? I I got called in, I think once or twice my junior year. Okay. So in, in the spring, year, it must have been. Yeah. Yeah. So junior year was 2014 going. So you graduated in 2015. Yeah. Well, I should have, but I graduated yeah. early. So yeah. So okay. yeah, I think my first cap was 2014. Okay. And do you remember your first cap? Well, yeah. <laughs> Cause we're definitely <laughs> going to talk about this. Or okay. do you remember your, do you remember your first three caps? Yeah. They, I was 0 and 3 and nobody's ever done that in the history of the U.S. Women's national team. Because the the U.S. Women's National Team has never like lost three games. Like they weren't consecutive, but it's still it, the how fact, the fact that they weren't consecutive. So guys, the oh first my three God, games, it's so embarrassing. Sam 
either started or subbed into a game, got a cap. That's what it means. Um, with the full women's national team, the first three games she participated in, the team lost. lost. Which I, in the fact that they're not consecutive, I find this stat maybe one of my favorite stats of your career because, because <laughs> it's just so funny. Like no one, in the fact that you know that and you remember it, and it's just, and it's true. We the national team really doesn't lose that much, and and the fact that you and knowing you now very well and how much you probably were just in your head being like, Oh my God, it's me. Exactly. (laughs) Well, I remember when I realized it too, because so the first two were consecutive. It was at all Garve and it must've been 2014 when we actually didn't do great. It was, it was a poor showing by the entire team. Nothing to do with you. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that I'm, I'm over it. Good, but I, but I appreciate you saying that. And so then, then the next one was in Brazil, I think was I like about a, maybe a year later. Cause I was done with college at this point, but it was before the draft. Oh yes. It was um, December of 2014. So, yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I got another one, but we lost to Brazil too. So oh, two sorry. of them, the first one and the third one I subbed in and I think okay. we we're already losing, okay. but yeah. the second one, I started the game and we were losing three zero at halftime which probably that's also a stat that's maybe never happened before. But I remember when I realized that I was 0-3, like personally, I said to Haif, Haif, like, do you know that I'm 0-3? And he was like, yeah, Sammy, that's never happened before in the history of the US Women's National Team. And I was like, leave it to Haif to make sure. I mean, he knows. He knows. He knows. Oh, he knows. Haif he knows. Our, yeah. For people listening is our um, press officer. Yeah. So he, and he literally knows every stat you want to know about the Women's National Team. Well, Regardless of your um, unfortunate first three caps, you you head into you know you you come out of UCLA. You have a national championship. You also have spent time with the women's team. Whether you are want to think of that as good times mm-hmm. or not yet, but mm-hmm. you go into the draft and you're selected fourth overall by Western New York Flash. R.I.P. to the Flash. Um, what so talk about talk about the draft like what was that like how are you feeling going into that yeah well it's so cool to see how far the draft has come because I was at national team camp and it was I think it was at 9 a.m on the east coast it was 6 a.m on the west coast and we were in LA so I just woke up to check twitter and to see what team I went to but I I kind of knew I was going to western New York okay so I just confirmed it on have they told you that yeah I think I must have talked to someone on the phone I, I don't actually like really remember, but I must have heard so, or maybe, maybe Jill had told me, I forget. I like, don't remember the details. Yeah. I just remember I woke up and che- confirmed it that I went forth to Western New York and then I went back to sleep. Really? Yeah. Because at, at the time, I don't think it was really much more than that. Um, True. And then I just remember being in camp um, and you guys had the world cup that year. So it was like a huge year. And that camp was, I remember was really like, stressful like am I going to even get invited into the next one and I didn't so I just went to Western New York and had my whole first season there and got called back in like towards the end or maybe when it was over um for the victory tour but um it wasn't like the best year I think it was the team struggled a little bit but I think it was like another good learning opportunity for me and another time to transition into like the next phase that required even more professionalism so um I am very glad that it all happened though, because it led to the next year. Yes, it did. Um, which was like that miracle Western New York year where Paul Riley came and um, the team just like really gelled for whatever reason. And we ended up just like loving the team so much. We had great, the best team chemistry. Um, we somehow squeaked our way into playoffs and overcame the odds to win the whole thing, which was, it's like probably besides the world cup, it's like probably my favorite soccer memory ever was that run with Western New York in 2016. Really? So, okay. So first of all, your first season with Western New York flash, you start every game and you're the top scorer on the team along with, well, I think it was, I think I had four goals. Okay. Well, so your, your snacks co-host Lynn Lynn Williams. I don't know. They don't have the, they don't have the stat here. (laughs) I wonder why. (laughs) Well, regardless you are, you were the top scorer along with Lynn, which that's so cute. You guys could talk about that. The four we goals should. That we both scored. We should. 
and eight. Um, yeah, you should. Um, and then, so also, I, and I, I think that I just, I just black things out that like, sometimes I don't want to remember, especially when it comes to soccer. I don't remember the New York flag. I don't remember you guys winning in 2016, in 2016. Yeah. I don't know why oh, I, I can show you some highlights, Kelly, that would just knock your socks off. I'm sure if I saw the game, I, I would remember it, but it's, it's okay. I'll show you. Wait, 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 wait. You guys played the final in Salem stadium. Is that what it's called? Salem? No, we played. So we, we were fourth. So we had to play number one. So we played Portland at Portland and we won in overtime four to three. Okay. It was like a wild semifinal. Was this, was this when you guys were scoring on throw-ins? Like, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. I do remember that then. And then, then you in the final Washington in uh, Houston. Oh, I do remember this. It's all coming and, back to me now. And they were winning. Yes. I think two to one. And it was like over, like the game was like legit over. I remember somebody told us that their owner came down and that they had like loaded up the confetti for Washington oh and Lynn you can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> and Lynn scored. Yeah. You assisted or no, you scored. Nope. Nope. Lynn scored. I think I'm like forgetting the details. I don't know how did Jess cross it to Lynn and she scored a header and it was two to two and we go into overtime and PKs. Okay. And then our goalkeeper, Sabrina D'Angelo made three saves in, in and PKs. we won. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, but time out. Did you miss a PK in this PK? Shoot? Yep. How did that feel? What were you thinking? How, it was like, like, it was horrible. I don't even want to talk about it. And I'm not, I'm not actually over that part yet, but then we won. Okay, we don't have to talk about it. I know I like could have won it for us and I did it, but then Sabrina did. So it was still great. There you go. Well, that's pretty, I, I now talking this through with you. I remember this game and I remember yeah. watching and I do remember being like, oh, spirit, oh, spirit has it yeah. in the bag. Yeah. Win. Yeah. In the bag. So I that, know. that along with 2019 is. Yeah. My favorite. Really? Yeah. Because it was like, so we were such underdogs, like we barely even made playoffs. And then like Portland was number one. Like they were so good. It was like, we, how are we going to go to their stadium with 20,000 people in it and win? And we like did it. Yeah. And we, it really just felt like we were like, Paul used to call us the bad news bears because we really like, we were young. Like we didn't have that much experience. Like none of us like were really on the national team at all at the time. Um, I think that it was, I was an alternate at the Olympics. And, and I think other than that, nobody was really with the team. So we were just this like young group of like hungry underdogs and we just like came up and like pulled off this incredible feat. And I think that that's why the courage still has this like kind of identity of underdogs, even though people hate to people hate that the courage sees people hate it as the underdogs. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. But it's like a, it's like the core of the DNA of the team. Absolutely. No, I think where it all started. Yeah. I think, I, I think that, um, now North Carolina courage, what you guys started back then and what you continue to do through these, the next couple of years was pretty incredible. And I do think it came down to like a team culture, DNA type atmosphere. Like, I think that I really do think that's why you guys have been so successful, just seeing it from the outside. But before we talk about, and I hate saying this North Carolina courage dynasty, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about 2016 Olympics because that's happening. That, that happened the same year as you guys had this mm -hmm. magical run and you won and had one of your favorite wins or championship wins in your career. So in 2016, you know, like you said, you came into the national team 2015 and then didn't get called back until later that year and then going into 2016. So you were vying for a spot on that team and ended up being named an alternate. So Talk about that situation, um, moment in your career a little bit. Yeah. Well, I remember thinking like early in 2016, like, I mean, you kind of start like counting the spots and you're kind of like, is there room for me? Can I do it? Can I ever start? Could I ever be one of these 18 people and the roster spots just fill up really quick. The team is yeah. so talented and there's so many people that are like capable of making it, that it comes down to performance. Um, and I think that I, there were players who were performing much better than me. So I kind of started to like see the writing on the wall as the year wore on. And when Jill called and told me I was an alternate, I kind of expected that. Um, 
And I think it's such an interesting role to play. And I've talked about this before and like, so has Sonnet, but so I was so lucky I had Sonnet with me because we kind of kept each other in check. You, my own personal disappointment was so great. And it, it felt like the Olympics was close, but slipped away. And that I was maybe just a spot or two away from making it. And would I ever get this opportunity again, but we still traveled with the team. So our kind of what we put out into the, our vibe and our like energy was actually still going to affect the team. So Absolutely. being so disappointed was like, we kind of had to like, keep that in check. Yeah. It um, wasn't an option really. It, I mean, yeah, it, exactly. It was, but you guys are the type of people who like, were like, this isn't an option. It's important to, well, I mean, we had to, and I, yeah. I, I'm glad we had each other cause it was hard. And I think that we like did our best to be there for the team as best that we could. And, um, I know that we both were like, we're never fucking doing this again. Um, so I think it's, it's pushed us both. And it's been like one of those really like motivating things that I know I look back on and say like, okay, are you going to get up and do your workout or are you going to be an alternate again? Um, so it was in the long run, obviously a good thing and a learning opportunity. And, um, of course we wish that we could have done more and, and help the team, but, um, it is what it is. And I think yeah. we learned a lot. No, and we were, sure. we were there with Hayo and Ash too, which was like, they were the best to be there with as well. And, and we had like our fun moments because we'd go to the gym or we'd yeah. have do an extra treadmill workout when the team didn't train. Um, and I, it's like some of the funniest memories I have of there is like running with Hayo on the treadmill or one time we like caught oh. this group on the street doing Zumba. Do you remember oh, yeah. that? I, I remember hearing about it. Yes. And yes. Dawn, like for some reason was like, go do the Zumba. So we were like dancing in the street, like the four American players. It was so weird. Um, but we got through it and, and yeah, it was, it's definitely like serves as motivation. I think for sure. The last player I would ever want to find myself on a treadmill next to is Hayo. So I feel for you. And oh that group is an amazing group as the, you know, like you said, the job of an alternate is one to be ready, but also super supportive and not let, you know, the, the disappointment of missing out affect the team. And like the four of you guys had off to, you guys did amazing and are, and are such, all four of you guys are such good teammates. So um, just know that it didn't go unnoticed or unappreciated um and also we lost we lost in the quarters we had a terrible olympic I know. it was an absolute disaster it still haunts me to this day so um you technically don't have that like i don't know bad x on i mean head. i was still there it's fair enough. Yeah, i was fair still enough. there fair so yeah. yeah but enough of that enough of that but i do want to bring up one one story from <laughs> okay. Do you know what I'm going to talk about? No, and I'm so me? nervous. Okay, so can we talk about the Swatch watch story? Please. <laughs> I wish we it? could call I wish we could call Sonnet in for this. No. I don't know. I don't know if like people are going to find this as funny as we did. It's such a silly thing. Like it's just one of our like favorite things to joke about, but I think the whole Olympic roster were they Omega? Yes, yeah, so Omega was an Olympic sponsor. I think Swatch was too. Maybe, I don't know, but um, yeah. Okay. Continue. So the whole Olympic roster got, um, these really like nice Omega watches, like silver, very nice. Yes. And, and lucky for us, like the alternates just got like swatch watches <laughs> and it was, they were so like, it was so thoughtful to get them. Like I'm not, yeah. <laughs> no, no disrespect to swatch watch, no disrespect. but didn't you get the, the swatch watch and you didn't know people had gotten the Omega watch yet? Yeah. So like we opened this gift and it, it, like lucky that the alternates got anything at all for sure this is but not me, us and, Sonnet, it's just, it's, me yeah. and Sonnet opened the gift we were like cool like USA swatches yeah and then like we started like, wearing something and like showing people and then like all the other girls had gotten these like omega like adult nice watches adult. and and it just like serves now as like a joke and further motivation to like get the get the adult watches. So Sonnet, I think still has her swatch and she like brings it with her and like, wears it? I mean, I love that. And also, yeah. So people, I mean, we, we've gotten some really cool perks on. Yeah. That's like one of the cool things about this job is like, we've gotten fun perk. Like, do you have one favorite <laughs> free thing that you got? Cause I have mine. Oh, dude. Well, the first thing that comes to mind was from this Olympics, because it was like, my first like near roster, like I was with the team when you guys went to the Olympics. So I like got some of the perks 
and I got Alex got us like an iPhone and like Beats, and I would and maybe something else. Oh, oh my God! Also, this the the um, Samsung phone. Oh, I know that's Sorry. like a whole nother debacle. I'll tell that in a second. But I was walking yeah. back to my room with this brand new iPhone and like Beats, and I want to say like one other like Apple product, an Apple Watch maybe. And I literally was being like, you guys, I am like so rich. Look at all this stuff I have. And I was pumped. And I think like yeah, years- it's cool. It's so cool. And years later, like I think before the World Cup, I got interviewed and I said that. And they like put it in an, a magazine somewhere. Like one time I got all this stuff and I felt so rich. So rich. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that, is, that is so something that would happen to you. My, I know. My favorite or the best ones I ever got was Ideal Image. We got it after um, oh, yeah. 2015 World Cup. The whole roster got sent free Ideal Image for a year, which is like laser hair removal and like other different fun aesthetic perks. And I was like, <laughs> ap- I would never get this for myself, but absolutely. And then we got Rent the Runway, shout out Rent the Runway post 2019 and like such a great perk. Yeah, I used that one too. Same. I use that one a lot. I use both of them. Um, all right. That was just, and we don't have to talk about the Sam's. You, you should talk about that on snacks. Okay. With Lynn, just bring it okay. up. Okay. If you want to hear that to story. story. Yeah. 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 It's a good one. It's funny. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> so back to end of your cell and to North Carolina courage dynasty, you guys go on post winning you so so when did new york flash turn into north carolina courage it was like sometime in that off season i remember i was like home training with a boys team and i was in the car with christy and steph and i was like you guys go in i have to like get on this call because western new york had like called a conference call Mm. and they were just like we're you're moving to north carolina it was like i think it was like a pretty quick call i think i went in and did the practice and um I kind of remember just being like, okay, like as long as it's still the team and it's still Paul, like, well, I don't care where we are. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, then, then that next season we moved to North Carolina. Yes. And in that next season, your first season in North Carolina, you're named to the NWSL best 11 and a finalist for MVP. And then on top of that, you guys go on this remarkable run. You win three NWSL shields in a row and two NWSL championships. And it's really, I mean, the first dynasty that NWSL has seen. So what, like, you kind of spoke on it already, but what, what would you say? I mean, what, what was that like? Like, I feel like that was really you, your team had this momentum, but then you, I feel like this was like you starting to put your print on the game here in the league, but then also with the national team. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. I think, I mean, I would credit the courage more than myself in all things. I think that like my, the success that I've had with the national team and, and any like personal success I've had, I, I really feel has been so influenced and shaped by the culture that we built at with North Carolina and with Western New York originally. Um, I just feel like it's that, like that growth mindset where Mm. like when we talk about success. It's just about like working hard every day and getting better every day and not necessarily about winning the whole thing or, or thinking too far ahead. And I think I just really like adopted that. Um, and I, I genuinely, now I really do view every day as an opportunity to get better. Um, and that's like my ultimate goal and ultimately what I would, how I would define success. So I think at, at that time, 2017, we were in a new place. Um, I remember, I think we won our first four games And it was like, so new to us um, because the year before, yeah, we had won in the end, but it's not like we had ever won four games in a row before. And I remember just thinking like, wow, 12 points. That's really going to come in handy somewhere down the line. But we just like went on and like kept winning and like kept doing well. And I think we just had like this underdog mentality of like, nobody expects us to like do any of this. And at the time, I don't, I don't really think that they, they did. I think people thought Western New York was like a fluke. Um, but we just like kind of put together this group of like hodgepodge, like we were all just like good at what we needed to be good at and it just worked and it fit together. And I remember we won the shield, but then we lost in the championship to Portland and just kind of kept coming back and kept working to get better. And, um, yeah, it was just like a culture that really values 
like growth and working on things every day. Do you feel like that culture was driven by the players or by Paul? I think, it, I think that it is certainly like a marriage of the two. Um, but I think that in Western New York, Paul was the catalyst to our success. I think like we had it in us, but we needed him as like a guiding figure and, and coach. Yep. And, um, it clicked. And then I just think that the, even the way the team was structured, like we bought in so wholeheartedly, like there was, nobody had any other ideas. Like nobody was like, oh, he wants us to play this way, but we think we should be playing like this. Like none of that. He said something and we were like, yes, like, okay. It's, that's so funny that you say it that way because it's so true. I feel like so many teams, you have people, like you have the coach say one thing and then people will turn around and be like, no, we're going to do that. Yeah. And I, I think that that's like one of the biggest like hurdles to success. And I don't know how he did it, but like to this day, I think that like his influence on the group is immense and Um, I think we also have some like incredible leadership within the team. And and at the time, like Abby Ursaig and and McCall Zerboni, like we had Jess McDonald, we had incredible like leaders who showed the younger players to buy in and showed us how to do that. And, um, that just like the way it came together and the way we meshed, I think doesn't happen very often. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it does take something special for to be able to have that kind of run and that consistently or consistent success in professional sports year in and year out. It's yeah, it's, it's definitely a, an a X factor to be found, which is good on you guys, even though I haven't won yet. So a little pissed about that. <laughs> but, um, so you guys obviously create this, this dynasty. Um, but let's talk about 2019 world cup. Okay. Going in, going into 2019. So where where are you at at this point in terms of national team? Like, where do you find yourself out going into this year or into the year, into that year, 2019? Yeah. Well, I, 2018 was like not a great year for me. I had a pretty serious knee injury at the end of 2017. And so was kind of working my way back throughout 2018 and didn't really feel like myself again until the end of 2018. So coming Mm -hmm. into 2019, I think I was like, okay, I mean, at the time you don't see it like this, but this is how I like tell it looking back. I was like, okay, didn't have a great year coming off my knee. I'm playing like myself again. I'm going to try to earn my, earn my way onto this world cup team and and try to like earn some playing time. Um, and yeah, I, I, that's what I like tried to do. I, I think it was like really hard. Obviously there's so much talent on the team and, um, it took like a lot to get me in a position to, to be playing, but Um, I think that when I got opportunities, I took advantage of them and worked my way onto the team. When I think the year before there was a time where I wasn't sure I was going to make the roster. For sure. I, I ask because I remember you (laughs) in, you know, beginning of 2019 into, and even, you know, after once we won, how you felt and just your confidence and your, uh, approach or perspective of everything that was happening. And I kind of, I was, I was with the team and then I, I had, I was out for a little bit. So I, I wasn't consistently in practice with the national team leading into the world cup or for, for like a, for the middle part of the spring where a lot Mm -hmm. of, I don't know, consistent trainings were happening, but I remember people being like, Sam is crushing it. She's doing so well. She's just got a, we like, we're going to need her. Like we need, like, she's got to stay the course because I remember talking to you and you being very stressed and obviously not wanting a repeat of 2016 and just being worried where you're going to find yourself or, you know, am I even going to make this roster? And I remember telling you being like, everyone's saying you're, (laughs) you're doing amazing. And, and, and the hard part, what people probably don't realize is that you could do so well on the national team. You can do so well at trainings, but at the end of the day, only 11 players get to step on the field. And with, you know, with our team, there's usually consistent starters. So sometimes even if you're doing so well, you might not, you might not get an opportunity. You might not be starting, but the reality of a world cup, big tournament is you need more than just, you need every single one of the 23 players. And 
So I remember being like, Sam, just, we're going to need you. So you need to be ready and you're going to make this team. And I don't need you to worry about making the team. I need you to be worrying about being the best you can possibly be for this team when we get to the world cup, because we're going to need you. And lo and behold, we get to the world world cup and you, you start, how many games you start? You started a handful of games and played basically every game, right? Uh, yeah. Except the Chile game. Yeah. I played it in all the games except the Chile game. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I started five. So I think it's so funny that you say that, like at the time I didn't see it, but it's funny even now when you are consoling or, or just talking to somebody about their situation, it's like, all you can say is stay the course, keep doing what you're yeah, doing, absolutely. keep going, you're doing everything right. And like, when you're the one in it, it's so hard because you're like, but it's not working yet. Like, it's not enough. I need to do more. I need to score a hat trick. I need to do a bicycle kick. You're like, I need to do something like crazy, but it's not yeah. true because I think like my parents always just say like the cream rises to the top. And it's just like, eventually, if you do all the right things, if you have self-discipline, if you keep making the right decisions and putting yourself in good situations to succeed and performing consistently, it's just eventually it's going to happen. And uh, I feel like in that situation, it, it did happen for me. And that was great. And I was just so honored to be able to play a part in helping the team win. It's my, there's my favorite memory is that world cup. So. Yeah. What was it like getting the call that you were on the team that you made the roster? Well, it's so funny because I I got asked that around that time. And I remember like, I'm like a stress, an anxious person. So sometimes I like, don't sleep that well, but I okay. knew Jill was calling in the morning. And I, I like slept through her call. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I like woke up to oh a missed my call. Oh my God. Sam. And it was like okay. so funny because it, it was like 10. Like I don't, I can sleep in, but like knowing me, you'd think that I would have been up all night waiting. And I think that yeah. at that point I knew that I had done everything I could and that I was in a position where it was out of my control, but that I had done what I had set out to do. And I think that that's where that like growth mindset comes in. It's like, I've gotten better. I've put myself in this position and I've like, at this point, if I don't make it, like there's nothing I could say I've done it all. Um, so I think I felt like I kind of felt a satisfaction, like before the call even. Um, and then when I, when I talked to Jill, I think she said something like, Oh, like, am I waking you up? And I was like, what? Like, no, of course not. Like, no, no, no. I'm so sorry. I missed it. Um, I've been up training, but yeah, right. Exactly. But I, I think like deep down I knew, and I was proud that I had gotten myself to that point. That's amazing. Well, you, obviously you make the team, you become, you're a huge factor in us winning that world cup, but how are you feeling before every game stepping onto the field? Like, what was your, where, where was your head at? Well, different games, different feelings, Okay. ups and downs. Right. I remember before the first game, I remember just during the national anthem, I was standing there like this. And Huge I know, yeah, nobody can see, but I was smiling and I could see my parents in the stands. And I, that was the moment that I like believed I had made it and believed that I was actually going to start in the game. Cause at every oh. moment until then, like even in the warm up, something could have gone wrong. It's so so true. when I was standing there for the national anthem and, and actually about to start, I was just like, oh, I did it. And like kind of had this self realization that like this, finally, I can accept that I've actually done it and I'm here. Um, and then I don't know, different games, different things. I remember before the France game, I was like pacing around my room, watching the eight mile rap battle scene with Eminem, like just, no, you yeah, were. I was. And I was like, just kind of like an emotional roller coaster, like on the bus. I was like, I like just restless. And I don't remember that many, like other key moments to be honest, but there was like emotions were everywhere. Yeah. It's, I mean, world cups are crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, would you, would you classify it as fun? <laughs> um, fun. I mean, I had fun. <laughs> like right? I had okay, fun. I'm just curious. Okay. Um, yeah. like I remember one time me, Sonna and Rose were like, just da- make doing dances in the hallway. And like, we were actually doing dances like quite a bit. Like I had my pockets of fun. Like I remember also yes. after the semifinal, me and Sonnet were dancing like hard, hardcore dancing. And Dawn had to kind yeah. of come in and be like, you guys like need to stop. Like we have another game. 
like you're exhausting yourselves. Yes. <laughs> um, so I definitely, and then after, of course I had fun, but the whole thing was like a combination of obviously fun and a huge honor and the most amazing thing ever, but it was stressful. And it was like very emotionally draining and taxing. Completely agree. Yeah. Cause I remember being in it and being like, this isn't fun. Like it'll be fun when we win, but this isn't fun right now. And obviously yeah. it is, there's moments of fun. The games are fun, even though they're super stressful. But for me, it's as soon as the whistle blows or really once I get on the bus to the game, I feel not calm, but like focused and not anxious. Cause I'm just like, all right, it's time to go to work. But yeah, I'm always curious if other people feel that way. Do you have a favorite memory from the world cup? The final whistle blowing. <laughs> That's mine. I'm just kidding. I mean, that was, that was definitely up there. That was incredible. But I having my parents there the first game and like knowing that when I, because that was my moment that I like realized I had made it. And for them to see it, I think because I know that they had given so much to my career and sacrificed so much throughout mm -hmm. the years to like get me to games. And I remember my dad like driving me home through the whole East coast, we'd have to stop at Dunkin' Donuts in Connecticut at 2 AM to get a coffee, to stay awake. Like, and then my dad, and then my dad like went to work the next day. Um, yeah. like they just, they gave up so much of their lives to give me that opportunity. And so just sharing them with them then like, Hey, you guys, like I finally made it. I'm actually here. We did it. Um, was like, I'm on the field. Yeah, like I'm nothing the can field. go wrong now. Like we're here. We did it. Like, thanks. I think that was, yeah like just a really special, like family moment for me. Oh, I love that. Um, do you have any favorite memories from the celebrations? If you want to do one, talk about any of those. <laughs> no. I think someday, like someday when it's a story about like 10 years ago, I'll tell all these stories. Great. You can do that. I mean, we had a good time. No, no, no shame in that. I have a little bit of shame about a couple of things, Kelly, but you know what? Fair enough. I think Fair that enough. I, I am hoping still that I'm going to go down to somebody who celebrated hard when she won. And you know what? That's what, so in 2015, we didn't really celebrate that hard. Like we, yeah, we just didn't. We had the post game or post win tournament win in Vancouver. And then we didn't have consistent four days together where we did this time. And I was like, oh, we are taking advantage of this and we are celebrating because we just won and I am, I'm not doing it. Like I'm doing it big this time. <laughs> so I know the feeling. <laughs> I feel like I probably influenced you a bit um, on that. So apologies. Like I had a 2015 be like, all right, you know, calm, cool, collected, fun. We won 2019. I was like, no, we're partying. Yeah. Yeah. But Hey, but Hey, it's all right. Hey, we enjoyed yeah. it. We had yeah, a good time. Yeah. We had a good yeah. time. All right. 2019 great year. For us, for you, you're cr you're absolutely crushing it. We go into 2020, and you know, COVID hits. We go through the whole debacle. What's going to happen? We have uh, what's it called Challenge Cup, and then you make the decision to go over to Manchester City. So talk about that decision because you were the first person to sign overseas last year from any of the players on the national team. Yeah. Well, I think that at the time, like so much was up in the air. Um, we, the fall series with the NWSL hadn't been announced yet. And I was kind of thinking like, how am I going to continue down this road to become the best player that I can be? I need to challenge myself and go to an environment where I'm going to be training and playing games. And, um, a little bit earlier in the year, my agent had suggested that this might become an option. Um, and as soon as I heard it, I was like, well, that's like an incredible opportunity. It's man city. They're such an incredible club um, that I'm, I'm so honored that they would even want me. So I just started thinking about it and considering it. And it seemed like an opportunity that I couldn't pass up considering I was going to go and have this whole entire season to play during the end of BCL, what looked like at the time would just be a really long off season. Um, yeah. So I came and um, I've had such an incredible year here. It's been so much fun to, kind of experience soccer from this culture's perspective and get to know the girls. I, people are always like, what has surprised you? And I'm like, I like love the girls so much. Like they are such awesome people. They're so funny. 
Um, I genuinely feel like I have a good relationship with everybody here. Um, so it's just been like so great and so much fun. And my husband and our dog got to come for most of the fall. So in what was obviously a horrible year for so many people, um, I feel like I got this like new and unique opportunity to grow as a person and as a player. Um, and yeah, I just, I like, can't say enough good things. It's been such an incredible opportunity so far. Do you think you would have made the same decision if COVID wasn't a thing? Like if we would have just had a regular season last year, that's probably, that's a hard question. Yeah. I mean, it is a hard question. I think it's like no secret that I love the courage so much and leaving was never something that I was seeking. Um, I do think that in a, had the cycle of the world cup and Olympics been normal, that it would have been a, a good opportunity to go after the Olympics because there's a longer time before the next cycle, before the next world cup. Um, but I, I have no idea. Like it's, it's so hard to say. Um, yeah, for sure. I think that like the way things worked out, I feel confident that it was the right call for me at the time. And I've, I've had such an incredible experience here, so I, I wouldn't change anything, but it, it is hard to say if, if COVID never happened, where would we be? <laughs> true. It is. That is true. There's a lot of variables that played into the decision. And I had so much respect for you making that decision. Cause I, I remember talking to you and you just wanted, you, you were like, I got to continue to get better. Like I need to be in the place that's going to put me in a position to day in and day out, become the best I can possibly be. And I was like, yeah, like, oh, that's good. That's what you want to do. You know, like you, you need to do that. And you obviously made the right decision because you've absolutely crushed it over in the UK. Like you score, I, I'll check the the um, stat lines and like I was Sam scored again, <laughs> obviously. And you've just, you've just absolutely crushed it. So what do you think? I mean, do you feel like you're just hitting your stride? Like what do you think is um, contributing to your success at this point in your career? Well, I mean, I think that the team here has like welcomed me with such open arms and been so patient with me adjusting and, and been really willing to, um, like work with me to, to, to mesh well with, with the group. Um, I think the staff and the players alike have enabled me to get in positions to score goals and obviously like given me great passes and crosses. I've, I have scored a bunch of them with my head. So obviously that's more up to somebody's cross. Yeah. You Um, (laughs) But I, yeah, I mean, I just think it was like great timing for me to experience this. And um, again, I'm like honored for the opportunity and just grateful for the team being willing to put me in positions to have success and um, to work with me on just adjusting to a little bit of a different style. And I think it's been a lot of fun. Well, it's paid off because in the past year you were named and rightfully so, the U.S. Soccer Player of the Year for 2020, as well as the number one player in the world by ESPN, which is insane and amazing. And like I said, so deserving. Do you, like, is this something that you've set? I don't know. I want to, did you, is it something that you're like, I want to be, win, win these type of awards? Like, that's what I'm going after. Um... And it's, it's fine to say yes. Yeah. Because like- well, I mean, I, th- I don't think that like year in and year out, I've set goals to like win awards. I think, I mean, I, I think a lot, you want to be the I best. I want to be the best. I want to be the best that I can be. Um, but I think that what I have learned in winning a couple of things is that I didn't like feel good when that, when I won it, I think that I feel mm. good when I know I've done my best and learning that and, that. and like learning that an award doesn't make me like feel validated, but my performance makes me feel validated was actually really important. Um, and I don't get me wrong. I still like, I do, I want to win stuff. I want to win all the trophies. I, I of course want to win all the team things first. I think that that's, that does make me feel good when the team wins a trophy. Um, but I just think that I've kind of learned that like, it doesn't make me feel like I actually am the best. It makes me feel like, Oh, I should be playing better. Like, so playing my best makes me feel really good. And I think that that's the goal that I focus on day in and day out. Do you feel like you learned that by winning these awards and being like, Oh, like this is a nice award, but 
what I get my most value out of, or like when I feel validated is through a really good training, a really good game performance, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think so. I think I don't, I don't know that I knew this before. So I guess yeah. having like external success kind of makes you realize that it doesn't like just, it doesn't make you feel as good as knowing that you did the, the very best you could or that you worked really hard and helped in this great build up goal or worked, com- did something on the field that you've been working on. Like those are the things that make you feel really good and give you a lot of confidence. And yeah. I think I did learn that there's a difference between like external and internal validation. Absolutely. I, I love that. I think that's so mature and just, I mean, it, it's just true. Like that's the reality that in sports and in life, I think personally, but I love these awards for you because just seeing you grow as a player, like you're not that much younger than me, but to see <laughs> like, again, you're, you, you have this, this duck, uh, personality <laughs> where people see this like tower of power, but then they don't realize like, oh, like, oh my God, I'm fr- you know, freaking out ahead of games or whatever, but, or worried about making a roster, that sort of thing. But you're just, I don't know. I, I, I think it's fantastic. I'm so happy for your success. It's so deserved. And I remember telling you in 2019, like, just stay the course. You, you've got this, like you can be as good as you want to be. And like, don't stress over all these other things. So very happy for you and, and all the things. And th- this is just the beginning, I think for you. So it's very cool to see you get this recognition as the player that you are. Um, Thanks, Cal. Yeah, no problem. Um, so 20, well, I was gonna say 2020, it's 2021 <sighs> somehow. And, you know, we're going into, we got a second chance at potentially going to the Olympics and, you know, obviously your last Olympics was as an alternate. So what, where are you at right now with your mindset in this year? And I mean, you're over in Man City. Um, we have, we've been having national team trainings, that sort of thing, a couple games, but what are you, how are you feeling? Yeah. I mean, I think that I want to just keep pushing to, to like be in the best form that I can be and be, be the best player and be as sharp as possible so that I put myself in a good position to get picked for the roster. Um, obviously we have one more camp between, um, now and when the roster gets picked. So I think it's just about continuing to push myself physically and, um, sharpening up on some, some technical things and, um, making sure that I can perform well at camp so I can try to get picked. Make that get that Omega watch. Get that saying. Omega I watch. I, I don't even know if they're still no, sponsored. You know what, Cal? If it's a Swatch watch, somebody, I'll I will wear it proudly. Somebody send Sam US a damn Omega watch. All right. Um, so <laughs> not only are you are you winning these individual trophies, have you won, you know, you've won team trophies, but you're a podcast host. Yeah. And you, along with Lynn Williams, host snacks. For just women sports so everybody tune into that but give a shout out to snacks let's hear it well give us, give us a yeah snacks is lynn and i are really close we used to live together um the best of friends and we wanted to just do a fun podcast um but we talk a little bit about like our personal lives where are we at it's very like current we'll, we'll record it the day before it's released and then talk a little bit about soccer what are the games we just played um what's practice like like our lives are we traveling for the national team. Um, and then we have like a, this segment where we want to talk about like some real stuff, some current events, um, like race relations in America has been the primary real topic so far. Um, and then we just do a, a fun section. We ask each other weird questions, realize that neither of us wash our sheets very often. Um, Ew. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's been really fun. We've recorded two episodes. Um, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe. No better duo in the game to do a podcast like that. You guys are hilarious individually and together. So everybody go give snacks a listen. <laughs> um, all right. We're at the, we're at the repeat question moment in our episode. So the just women sports podcast is presented by Heineken and celebrates women in sports at the top of their game where each athlete is unique and successful and has a story to tell. So who's the one person in your life that has had the most, that has had the biggest impact on your career and why? I thought you were going to say who has a story to tell about you that nobody else knows. And I was like, shit. Oh my God, that would have been amazing. And also like, I thought, I thought you thought I was going to like 
take a beer, <laughs> beer down like the, the beer drinking <laughs> avenue. Um, who has had a big impact on me? Yeah. Let's, we're going to cheers somebody. Uh, well, I guess we've got to cheers Pat, my husband. I don't think I get, oh. I don't think I give him enough credit. What? I, you don't, think? I don't think I do. I, uh, I'm so lucky. I'm such a crazy I mean, person as we've established. I've known Pat since high school. Um, so he, I mean, we haven't been dating since high school, but he's really stuck with me through lots of these ups and downs. I think that what I value most about our relationship is that should am I, should I go this deep into this? Yeah, okay. please. Let's hear it. Let's shout out. Pat. We are like, shouting Pat out Pat. I think what yes. I value most about my relationship with Pat is that he'll like, he supports me like so unconditionally, but he will give it to me straight when like kind mm. of nobody else will. Um, I think I have like so many wonderful supportive people, but Pat like knows when it's time to be like, Sam, like that wasn't good enough, or you're not doing this right. Or you are thinking about this the wrong way, or you need to be better in this area. And I think that that's just like such a valuable thing to have with someone that I trust so much. Um, yeah. so I love him. He's great. He's a great dog dad. Um, he's a great cook. Yeah, he is. He's, he's, Pat's he's the, the best. Cheers to Pat. Pat is just, he is a top level human being. Yeah. Amen. Cheers, Pat. Um, all right. They say work hard, get lucky. How much of your success is predicated on luck? This is another interesting thing that Pat has taught me. I can't wait. He read this book. I wish I could think of the name of it, but basically like we all get lucky and we all like rely on luck sometimes in, in big moments or when we're like making decisions. And I think that mm. the better position you put yourself in to get lucky, the more often you get lucky. So if you crash your run in the box and it hits off your kneecap, it's like, well, good thing you sprinted all the way in there for it to hit off your kneecap. It's like, you can yeah. work so hard that like luck happens more often for you. So I think that it's obviously both. And I'm, I've obviously so privileged and been given opportunities that not everybody gets, but I think that I pride myself on, on working hard. And I think that now that I've learned this thing from Pat, I put myself in positions to try to get lucky too. I love it. So you have to give a number percentage Gosh. to it. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. What would you put? I don't know. That's questions for you. 90, 10. All right. 90, 95, 5. You pick one. 92 and a half, seven and a half. Final answer. Wow. Final answer. Mail it in. All right. That's, that's good. No one has done half percentages. I don't think so. You're our first one, <laughs> which I don't know why, but it's not surprising at all to me. Um, all right. You've accomplished so much already. Where do you want to go next? And how do you keep pushing? <sighs> well, I want to make, the, I want to make the Olympics roster. I want to win the Olympics. Hell yeah. Um, and that's, that's where, um, well, that's where my head's at right now. So I think I keep pushing by keep using that motivation that I have, that I haven't done any of this yet. Um, me and Sana will just keep reminding each other until we get there. <laughs> Look at the swatch watch on the, uh, on the cabinet <laughs> or on the dresser. <laughs> Amazing. Well, um, thank you for your time. It's it's very late over in the UK. We need to put you to bed, um, but you're the best. I love you very much. Um, you're a fantastic soccer player, but a more fantastic teammate and human and friend. So um, thanks for your time today. Wow. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was so nice. And I love you too. <laughs> <laughs>